We're starting a new series um, today uh, on miracles. And um, this uh, began to stir in me a couple of weeks ago um, when I was thinking about the miracle of Jesus rising from the tomb and uh, the significance of what that, that means to us. Uh, and so this morning, I want to talk about, we're gonna, I want to talk about uh, this idea of waiting on a miracle. Because all of us, at one time or another, have been believing for something and we're waiting on what God is going to do. I think the disciples did that after Jesus was crucified. They spent three years with him. Jesus goes to the cross, dies, he gets put into a tomb. And you got to believe that the disciples had a, now what? Now what are we going to do? Scripture tells us that some of them went fishing. Some of them hid because they were afraid that they were going to be killed. But there was a, a period there when there had to be some doubt. There had to be a place where they were in this waiting mode and they weren't sure what was going to happen. I've been there. I know most of you have been there at one time or another. But then a miracle happened. I want to talk about this morning. God, the Father, through Jesus, He created a natural laws that govern our earth. So when He made the heavens and the universe and the earth and all the stars and all the planets, He aligned everything that would have a natural law to it. In other words, the earth rotates around the sun. God created that. The moon rotates around the earth. God did that. God created gravity. God created the first and second law of thermodynamics. And I don't even know what that means, but that's what he did. A miracle is when God chooses to operate outside of the natural realm. Tim Keller, the great pastor, passed away just a few months ago. He said this, We modern people think of miracles as the suspension of the natural order. But Jesus meant them to be the restoration of the natural order. Before there was sin, before there was death, before there was disease, before there was destruction, before any of that was taking place, the supernatural was just another day. It was normal. And today, when we see God move in miraculous ways, He's stepping out of the natural realm and He's stepping into the supernatural realm. That's why we have this verse on this back wall, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What Jesus was doing 2,000 years ago, he's doing today. Some believe today that, that the gifts of the Spirit were done away with in the early church, that they ceased. They would be called cessationists, and, and that, that they don't believe that those gifts are in operation today. So it talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of healing, the gift of faith, the gift of prophecy, the gift, uh, the gift of wisdom, uh, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation. But if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then those gifts are in operation today. And as a church, we believe that. We believe God is moving supernaturally, and, and the way he does it often is he does it through people like you. He works through you. And so you matter. <laughs> Sometimes we don't feel like we matter. Sometimes we feel like we've, we've made so many mistakes in our life and we've, we've done so many wrong things and because we've fallen short all the time that we just walk in shame and condemnation because we don't believe that Jesus can really set us free from those things. But he does. Scripture says that in him is life. And that when we respond to his love, when we say yes to him. When we, when we come to a place of surrendering the way we want to do things and we say yes to the lordship of Jesus and yes to him being our savior and the scripture says in Romans 10 that when we invite him into our life it says that he becomes our lord and savior. I love what it says right after that. It says and you'll never be disappointed. Another translation says you'll never be put to shame. And so if you're, if you're living your life right now, and you feel like you're living in condemnation, you're feeling like you're living in shame, my, my question to you is, number one, do you know Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And two, if you do, then it's time to dig deeper 
get into the God's word, get into discipleship, and find out, okay, why am I carrying this? Because the Lord came to set you free from all that. We just sang the song about it. Chains broken, no more bondages. That we don't need to walk in that kind of oppressive spirit. And so starting this, today, I want to start talking about miracles, and we're going to talk about the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. It was one of the very last miracles Jesus did before he was crucified on the cross. And so let's look at the scripture. We're going to go through this chapter in John chapter 11. We're going to pick up here at verse 1. And it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You should have think about that. The one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. So Jesus gives a great answer there that, that, that he's going to be doing something about this. But I think it's interesting that, that Martha and Mary are reaching out to Jesus and there's this passive aggressive thing going on where it says, hey, Jesus, you know the one you love, he's sick. Like somehow by them reiterating, hey, the one you love, this is important, you love him, you love Lazarus, the one you love, he's sick, he's not doing well, I need you to come. We, we do this. We, we become passive aggressive at times. Like when our kids were little, like if one of our sons was acting up and doing something not right, my wife Kathy would say, hey, uh, you need to talk to your son. Right? You never ever noticed that, how, how you know, when the, the kids are acting up, it suddenly becomes the other parent's you know, responsibility, right? And, and we do that. We're passive aggressive. And these, these ladies are saying, hey, Jesus, Lazarus isn't doing well. The one you love is sick. Let me give you some context. Bethany is about two miles east of Jerusalem. I've been there. We've been there. And uh, if you go from Jerusalem to walk to Bethany, you walk through the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus would spend lots of time in Bethany. And he hung out a lot with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He, he called them friends. He would sit with Lazarus and hang out and drink coffee. And, and he would spend time with Mary and Martha. He would rest at their home. And so he had a strong relationship with these siblings. And, and what's amazing about this is what Jesus does next. Because in verse 5, it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, if I was just reading this for the first time, or if I was kind of leaning into, you know, studying and things like that, this would be a place I would stop. So, he hears that his friend who he hangs out with a lot, is sick and is probably going to die. And it doesn't say he got up and went right away. I mean, John, the disciple, wrote this. It, it, it doesn't say he delayed because there was a chance he might get arrested. It didn't say he delayed because it was a dangerous journey. It didn't say he delayed because there was a lot of traffic. It said he waited two more days. Now, I'm pretty sure if this situation was me, if I heard that someone that was close to me wasn't doing well, was sick, I would immediately stop what I'm doing and I would go to them. I'd, I got to be there. But Jesus waited. He delayed. And you got to ask why. See, so often those of us who are believing God for a miracle have to first, first learn how to wait on the Lord. You see, God is doing something in the waiting period. And we don't like the waiting period. We don't like to go through that. But you need to know that God's delay is not a denial. When we're waiting on the Lord to, to move, when we're believing for the miracle, God knows exactly what's happening. And He also knows that there's something bigger going on than maybe what you're asking for in that situation. Many of you know the story, but I wanted to share it briefly because it, 
it ties into this, this message so well. Our youngest son, Jared, who is on staff here, he's one of the pastors, he's the drummer. Um, when he was born, he uh, contracted a, a very serious virus um, right after his birth. And within a couple of hours after he was born, he wasn't doing so well. He, he started to crash. So much so that he ended up in, in NICU in an incubator. And he had all kinds of IVs in him. And they were doing x-rays, thinking that maybe he had a hole in his heart or a hole in his lung. He was struggling breathing. And they just didn't know what was going on. They couldn't tell us anything. And they were doing everything that they knew that they could do. It was a scary moment. We were crying out to God. We were praying and believing that God would touch him and bring healing upon his life. I think Mary and Martha were kind of in that same moment of waiting. It was only a couple of days, but when someone you love is dying, a couple of days can seem like years. As we're crying out to God, as we're believing for something to happen, and we're in this waiting period, so many times when we're in between the burden and the fulfillment, the prayer and God's answer, God is doing a deep work preparing us from within for the fulfillment. The waiting period oftentimes is more important than the miracle that God is going to perform in your life. He's developing something within you. He's transforming maybe the way you think and the way you respond and the way you see things because there's something greater at work here. There's something more that the Lord wants you to see and wants us to know. This, this story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, yes, it was for the people then, but it's for us today. And when we dig into God's word and we begin to grab hold of these truths, what the Lord is saying to us, allow the Holy Spirit to bring revelation and understanding. Let the Spirit of God teach you what the Lord wants you to know. Why? So that you become closer to God. You become more like God. You fall in love with people. And God can then begin to use you and work through you because he designed you and gifted you in certain ways that you're here for a reason. And, and here's the great thing about it. You're not only here for a reason, but you're here exactly at the right time. You're not too early, and you're not too late. And there will be a day that you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As a Christian, you will be standing before the judgment seat knowing that you're going to enter into the presence of, of, of the Lord. And the Lord is going to reveal all the things that you did in love. Because it says that nothing materialistic, will pass from this life into the next life. In Corinthians 15, it says it gets burned up. Wood, hay, stubble, all that stuff gets burned up. What passes through? Love, love passes. Love gets into heaven. Joy, that gets into heaven. Faithfulness, that makes it. Long-suffering, slow to anger. See, all of those things are the fruit of the Spirit. All of those things will pass through. And as you live in the fruit of the Spirit, as you operate walking in the truth of God's Word, growing closer and closer and closer to Him, becoming more like Him, beginning to walk in the giftings that God has given you, that you will someday stand in front of Him, and He's going to say exactly what He said to the Apostle Paul. You have done well, my good and faithful servant. You have run the race and you have won. You have fought the fight and you won. You won the battle. Welcome in. Receive a crown of righteousness. Oh, I want to hear those words. I want to hear those words, man. I want to stand and I want to be able to stand and go, wow, oh, I stayed the course. I fought the good fight. Yeah, I, there was times I wanted to give up. There was times I was ready to throw in the towel. There was times I, I, I quit believing that God is a God of miracles. I, I just started... I started pulling away without even realizing it. I just a little bit here and a little bit here. because I got disappointed a little bit because God didn't do what I thought he should do. And before I woke up, I realized that I had fallen so far back that I wasn't even sure if God would take me back. Mary and Martha, I think like many of us, couldn't see anything other than their spiritual disappointment. That Jesus didn't show up on time. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. 
And I think the question is, is how do we navigate the times when God's purposes conflict with our expectations of Him? What do we do with that? I think more specifically is, is what happens to your faith when you've begged God to do something and He didn't come through? I'm not talking about, you know, praying for a new car or praying for a final that you didn't study for or, you know, or, or, or praying for that right spouse. I'm not talking about that. When you stood in the gap and you prayed for the hard thing and you cried out to God and you needed a miracle, God wasn't there. At least that's what you felt and that's what you thought because all of us have thrown up the Hail Mary prayers and we've said things like, Lord, this is urgent. This is important, Lord. I need you. I've prayed, Lord. I've fasted. I love you, but my soul is troubled. There's something not right within me. I feel this uncomfortableness, and, and I'm not sure what it is because something is gnawing at me. Have you spent much time in the spiritual waiting room. I went into the NICU. Jared was in an incubator. It was in the middle of the night. It was 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We still didn't know what was going on. I laid my hands on top of the glass. I was this tiny baby boy trying to breathe as fast as to try and combat against the sickness. You know when you don't feel well, maybe you've got the flu, and you, you find yourself going, <sighs> you're just trying to work through the sickness. His heart rate was 225 beats a minute. He, he couldn't breathe fast enough. His, his breathing was <sighs> for hours and hours like that. I laid my hands on the incubator, and without even thinking, I prayed these words. Lord, this is your son. You brought him into the world. Lord, if you choose to take him out of this world, I want you to know that I'm still going to serve you. I didn't plan on saying that. I didn't think about it before I said it. It was just something that came from within me. I went back to Kathy's room. I sat on the edge of the bed. She sat up next to me. And I don't know what it was, but it was supernatural. And this peace came over me. And I put my hand down on Kathy's knee and I just said, he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. Sometimes it's the waiting that God can do His best work in you. You see, I'm not so sure that what the Lord was doing in that moment for me and for us was that He allowed the sickness to take place so that I could see my faith. You know, when Isaac was up on the mountain and he was about ready to be sacrificed by his father, and, and the whole idea was was we think that God needed to see the faith of Abraham, right? And that wasn't it. Abraham needed to see the faith of Abraham. And I think that's what the Lord was doing to me. And maybe the Lord has done that in you, where you're going through something. Something's not right. Something's not working. You're waiting. You're believing. You're trusting. And you're thinking what the whole idea is, is that God's going to do something in this. But what He's really doing is something in you through the process. Here's the thing, the moment we define God's love for us by Him doing what we need Him to do, we've chosen to live with a troubled soul. The moment we, we, we make God the one that is serving us and that our expectations are on Him to do something for us, we are going to live with a, a troubled sense that something just isn't right within us. 
If you let anger, doubt, spiritual disappointment persist too long, it will begin to rob you of your faith. And without even realizing it, a little bit of time goes by, and the next thing you know, a little bit more time goes by, and then one day you wake up and you say, oh my gosh, I haven't talked to God in weeks, months, maybe years. And the only time I ever do is when something goes wrong and I cry out to him. I haven't opened up the Bible. I, I've quit fellowship. I, have, I got out of my small group or my connect group. I quit going to church. I, I quit hanging out with Christians. I just started kind of doing my thing. And then one day you wake up and you're like, why is my, my life upside down? Why, why, why aren't things working out the way that I wanted to? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that, that God's favor comes alongside our faith. The greater the faith, the greater the favor in your life. God begins to open doors for you. He leads you in areas that you could have never gone, but because of your faith, His favor comes upon you and opens those doors. You may be struggling at work or struggling in your marriage or struggling with your kids or whatever it may be. And the answer may be, hey, why don't you start spending time with the Lord because he has the answer for the parents that are struggling with kids or for the husband and wife that are struggling in a marriage or for somebody that's struggling at work and struggling with money or whatever it may be. Because I tell you, I've, I've, every question I've ever, ever had, I've always found the answer in the Word of God. Sometimes it takes some digging. Years ago, for our anniversary, uh, I'm notorious at not doing a good job on our anniversary. Uh, sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't. And uh, I'm really bad at Valentine's Day. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Men, come on, guys, I need some help here. I need some support. <laughs> and, and just so you know, I dressed myself this morning, okay? I, I just want you to know. I got no help from anybody, all right? But one year, Kathy did this. She put together this, um, uh, I think they call them shadow boxes. It's deep, this picture frame. I have it in my office. And she, she found these amazing pictures. She wrote some things. She put it in there, and she, did, she, she took time. It took, took her probably a few hours to do this. She thought about it. She processed it. She worked on it. She was creative. She, she did all of these things. And, and then she gave it to me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. She thought about it. She put effort into it. She took time to do it. I was so appreciative. God is wanting us to think about him, to put effort into the relationship, to, to come alongside others and be that kind of person that makes a difference in somebody else's life. When God sees that, he's proud. He loves that kind of stuff. And when you do that, that's when you begin to live in victory. And that's when you begin to live in joy, even when the yucky stuff happens. Because the yucky stuff will happen, won't it? So how do we reconcile a troubled soul? Well, we're going to fast forward in this story a couple of days. And he tells his disciples, he says, all right, we're going to go to Bethany. Lazarus is asleep. He's not doing well. He's sick. And, um, and the disciples say this. Well, if he's sleeping, let's just let him sleep because... Because he'll get better that way. I mean, sleeping's good. And then Jesus just bottom lines. He says, he's not asleep, he's dead. And they're like, oh. And so, verse 17, it says, on his arrival, Jesus getting to Bethany with the disciples, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Say four days. Four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. That's pretty honest, isn't it? Here's what I wrote down. Learn to pray honest prayers. One of the greatest things that God wants from you is to be real. 
to be intimate in your prayers, to come to him and, and, and say, Lord, here I am. Uh, this is all of me. Like he doesn't already know. But to come and to say, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I need help with this. I, I need to know, Lord God, I need your presence in my life. I need to have understanding. I don't know what to do. Mary and Martha are not happy in this moment. Mary doesn't even come to greet Jesus. Martha doesn't even let him get, reach into town before she meets him out at the gate with her disappointment. And here's the thing. The funeral has already happened. The stories that when everybody got together, all of Lazarus' friends, when they got together and they shared the stories about Lazarus, man, I remember when he was 10 and he did this and they had the memorial service and, and, and you know, the, 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 the green bean casserole is probably, you know, eaten now and all of the stuff is done. And here comes Jesus four days after he's died, two days later, and he shows up and, and Martha runs out, doesn't even want him to come into where they're at. Mary stays at home. They're disappointed. I'm sure that they felt traumatized by everything. I've been a pastor for 27 years. And ironically, today is my 22nd anniversary of pastoring this church, 22 years ago. So, thank you. I don't, I, don't, I don't say that. I say that because being a pastor, there's story after story after story after story after story of dealing with trauma, death, broken dreams, broken marriages, all of the stuff. People in this room where I've been by the bedside of one of their loved ones and they died. And after 27 years of being a pastor and being a part of those kinds of things, you'd think I'd like have a PhD in trauma and being able to deal with it. And I still struggle. It's still hard. It's tough. It never gets easier. And what I've realized that in those moments, the best thing that I can do is talk to God honestly and be real about my prayers. See, we need to tell God how you feel, how you really feel, because that's where the intimacy comes from. Can you imagine in a, in a marriage with Kathy if I, if I never, you know, talked to her with my real feelings? If I just, you know, talked to her about things that don't really matter? We would have no intimacy within our marriage. It's the same thing with our relationship with God. We need to be honest. Secondly, maybe this is for some of you here today. We need to believe in Him again. We need to believe in Jesus Verse 22, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask, Jesus said to her. Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you? You see, Jesus is now getting to the real reason that all of this is going on. He's going to start bringing some perspective to these things. And Martha responds, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. And the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. They had lost hope and probably started losing some faith. And suddenly in the moment, 
they open themselves up to believe again. Let me tell you something. It takes courage to risk your heart and believe. Some of you in this room have dealt with quite a bit of hurt. Some have probably dealt with church hurt. Maybe a pastor said something or did something. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was somebody within the church and you got hurt. Or maybe you just, you have God hurt. Maybe God didn't come through for you. Maybe, maybe he didn't answer the prayer that you wanted him to answer and it just didn't work out the way you wanted it to work out. And, and so you have God hurt and you've kind of just done the proverbial stiff arm and you're just keeping God out here. That was for me for several years after my mom died. Young kid. And I just said, yeah, I'm kind of done with the whole God thing. He didn't come through for me. I was 12 when she died. I didn't reconcile with the Lord, really reconcile with the Lord until I was 27. It was after I'd gotten married. I'd carried that for, what, 15 years. I didn't know if I could trust God. I mean, could I really believe in Him again? And oh my gosh, when I turned back to the Lord and I leaned back in and I started seeking Him, getting myself back into fellowship and working through my stuff, you know, and all those kinds of things, I, God began to show up like I'd never seen Him show up before. And He began to answer prayer like I'd never seen before. And He began to stir in me new things. And I realized that He had so much more for me to do in life and He wants to do the same thing in you. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then it says that Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. It's interesting that it says that Jesus wept, and yet he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. What's he weeping for? He's weeping for Mary. He's weeping for Martha. He's weeping for Lazarus' friends who are all there. He was weeping because he cares. He has compassion. You see, I believe Jesus chooses to enter into your pain. Every tear you have cried, you are never crying alone because Jesus is crying with you. This word compassion, it's such a great word. It's di different than empathy. Empathy means that we come alongside somebody with understanding. But the word compassion means to co-suffer. When you're compassionate with somebody, what you're doing is you're entering into their world of suffering. And you're saying, I'm going to be with you in this moment. I'm going to suffer with you. I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to walk through this hand in hand with you. But my compassion comes alongside. That's what Jesus was doing with Mary and Martha. He was compassionate. And of course, we know what happened. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jared was supposed to be in an ICU, a NICU, for about um, 10, to, 10 days to two weeks. And um, we found out that he had contracted a serious, serious virus through uh, birth. And they were starting to treat it. What a lot of people don't know is that because of relationships that we had had and, and the years of building friends and, and relationships within church, and I want you to hear this when I say this, and I want, you, I want you to hear this as a positive, not as a negative. We had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people praying for Jared. And the reason we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people praying for Jared is because we invested into other people and we invested into church and we got into fellowship and we knew people that knew people that knew people. And so when, when life deals you a bad hand, when yucky things start happening, covering is there. See, when the flood is two blocks down the street, it's a little late to start praying. 
It's a little late to all of a sudden start gathering people around you when you haven't been gathering people around you, only when the circumstance hits. And you could feel the prayers. I mean, it was significant. Those, those five days were unbelievable because Jared was only in the hospital for five days. When, when, when he came out of that, he got well quickly. And I will never forget, we took him home. And for me, it was celebration time. I, I, I always break the laws of safety. Anybody like that? Just break the laws of safety. I broke the laws of safety. My wife had just had a baby. My son was in a NICU for five days. We get out of the hospital and the first thing we do, I was a youth pastor back then in Colorado. The first thing we do is we drive to this park called Clement Park, which was right next door to Columbine High School where the shooting took place. This was just months after the shooting. And we had a youth rally there where hundreds of teenagers came. And we had a band, and I got out, and I'm like, here's my boy! Yeah, you can hold him, Kathy. He's like, no, he just got it. He was sick, you know. And, uh, oh, we're celebrating. I might have embellished just a little bit there, but anyway. <laughs> Number three, worship team, you can come up, please. Thank you. The third thing is, is nothing is over until Jesus says that it's over. That's, listen, I feel like this is a Holy Spirit moment. When, when you hear a statement like that, that's an amen moment. Yeah! There's, there's a big difference between throwing out an amen to something or really, truly, deep down inside because of your closeness and relationship with the Lord that you're able to say this with assurance that nothing is over until Jesus says it's over, that you know that. That you get that. That your faith grabs hold of that truth. And that when, when, when that you know deep down inside that you're able to say, hey, I, listen, there's, there's breath and lungs. I'm still standing. I'm still believing. Nothing's over until Jesus says it's over. Look at this last verse, verse 38. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But the Lord's but, Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. This is interesting. The Jewish people, Jewish faith, believe that when somebody dies, that their spirit will hover up to three days, potentially for that person to, to live again. I don't think it's coincidence that Jesus waited four days. Here's why. The miracle wasn't about raising Lazarus from de the dead. The miracle was to reveal the glory of God. And by waiting four days, there could be no other explanation other than God did this. You ever, you ever hear people, or maybe you've done this, where you explain something God has done and you try and explain it away? Well, the doctors, they, they, were, they were pretty good doctors, you know. You ever done that? I think the Lord is doing miracles every day and we don't see it, we don't realize it and sometimes we just cast it off like, well, it's just lucky. It was just by chance that that happened. Here's the thing, sometimes Jesus will wait until the expiration of your expectation so he can reveal his glorification. See, the whole point was this to bring glory to God and that's what we're here for. That when we live our lives in such a way to bring glory to God, promise back to us is Jesus will give you life and he'll give it to you in the full. He'll bless you to be a blessing. The whole point was so that people could see the glory of God. Verse 40, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone then Jesus looked up and said, Father I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out and his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. 
You may be here this morning and you may be one that says, man, pastor, that's a great story and that's a great miracle and, and I get it, but I want you to know, I prayed, I sought God, I believed, and the cancer didn't go away. You may have fasted and prayed and the marriage still ended. You may be saying, oh, this is great, but it's too late for me. It didn't work for me. The miracle didn't come. Here's the thing. God is present in your temporary, but he's focused on the eternal. God is with you in the present, but he is thinking about you eternally. I don't understand why things always happen the way they do. And I think especially in the area of healing and sickness and things, that sometimes it doesn't work our way and, and we're struggling with understanding that. But there were two things, two powerful things that we need to see at the end of this story that were set in motion because of what happened with Lazarus and what Jesus did. The first thing was that after he passed away and was raised again, all the people in that area, all the Jews heard about what was going on, and so they came. They came to see what happened. They came to, to see Lazarus alive. They, they came to experience the miracle. It drew hundreds of people. And the second thing that happened is word got back to Caiaphas, who was the one that, that, that uh, was going to have Jesus put to death. And as soon as Caiaphas heard the story about what Jesus did with Lazarus, he said, that's it. It's time to kill that guy. It's time to put him to death. Two things brought people together, and it also began the motion of having Jesus crucified. If you jump into chapter 12, if you go one chapter over from chapter 11 here, here's what began to happen was put in motion. Mary anoints Jesus with perfume. It's symbolic to preparing a body for burial followed by the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, followed by the arrest in the garden, followed by the torture in the courtyard, followed by the crucifixion, paying for the debt that he did not owe, but you and I did, and he paid that debt, followed by Jesus hanging on a cross and saying, it is finished. Nothing is over until Jesus says it is over. Nothing is finished until Jesus says it is finished. God has a miracle that he's working in each one of our lives. And it may be in the moment, it may be in the present, but it may be a miracle that is working for eternity in your life that is going to make a difference as you move forward and you walk in the fullness of what God has for you. You're going to have hiccups along the way. There's going to be difficult seasons. But the big picture is, is to stand in the presence of God and be with him eternally. That's the game plan here. And Jesus uses this miracle with Lazarus to show the bigger the bigger picture, and that is to bring glory to the kingdom. That's what the miracle was for. You see, the real miracle here is that death no longer has a stain. Death no longer is the end. When my father was on his deathbed, he was 65 years old. He was about ready to go into a comatose state. I was with him. I took a knee by his bed. I grabbed his hand, and I grabbed it tight, and I said, Dad, I want to, I want to say something to you. And I want you to know that this isn't me giving up on you. But I'm, I know you're going to go be with the Lord. Can I ask you a favor? And he looked at me and he goes, yes, what? Will you give mom a hug when you enter his presence? See, my eyes are on eternity. The Bible says that Christians, we're aliens in this world. We're sojourners. We're just passing through. See, the real miracle is eternally in the presence of God on heaven and in earth. And so Jesus said once again in verse 25 to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Even though they die, 
they're going to live. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And my question to you, just like question that Jesus questioned to the people back then, do you believe this? Do you? Let's pray. I know that this morning, Lord, that there's probably many of us, including me, that would say, I think I have a troubled soul. Something's unsettled. Something's not right. And Lord, we know that only in you things can be made right, that understanding and revelation can come because of you and knowing you. Maybe this morning your troubled soul is is that you just haven't come to a place of saying yes to Jesus yet. I think this would be a right moment to just say if you're here, you don't know Jesus and you want to know him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if you confess your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, it says you'll be saved. So if that's you, nobody's looking around, everybody's head bowed, just put your hand up, put it right back down. We're not going to call on you. It's just a a proclamation of saying, I want to know Jesus. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. Nothing to be ashamed of. Actually, you should be proud. Scripture says when anyone comes to know the Lord, it says the angels begin to sing in heaven. So maybe you're here and you're saying, I've just never done that. You just put your hand up, put it right back down. It's just saying that that's what I want to do. The second thing is, is that maybe you're here this morning and you're just saying, hey, I've walked from the Lord. I, I want to, I want to re, I want to start over again. I want to re-engage with the Lord. And I want to, I want to start walking in the ways of Him. If that's you, just put your hand up, put it right back down. It's just a measure. I'm just recommitting my life back to the Lord. I see a couple hands. I see a hand. I see another hand. The Lord's just speaking. He's just saying, hey, let's start new today. What a great day to start. Resurrection day. Just starting a new walk with God. And so, Father, I thank you today, Lord God. Lord, for those that are, that are struggling with whatever it may be, Lord, may we be like Lazarus, Lord. We take off the grave clothes off and we quit walking around like we're dead men. Lord God, that we would walk in the fullness of you and that we would live life, Lord God, bringing glory to you in all that we do. And so, Lord, we give you thanks, Lord, for all of that. We love you so much, Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, what do you say we go out on a big up real quick with one last little bit of worship song? You up for that? God bless you. If you need prayer for anything right after service, we'll have our prayer team right down here in front.